Welcome skeptics and truth seekers to Schoolhouse Croc, the podcast that fearlessly exposes the real deal behind public education in the state of Colorado. I am your host, Stacey Castile. And on this show, we are not here to sugarcoat. We are here to unveil the truths, challenge the norms, and unpack the crock of you-know-what that often goes unnoticed in the realms of education. In each episode, we will shine a light on the intricacies, controversies, and untold stories that make up the educational landscape of Colorado. From questionable policies to groundbreaking initiatives, Schoolhouse Croc aims to peel back the layers and present you with a raw, unfiltered look at what's really happening inside the classrooms and corridors of Colorado's public schools. Get ready for a candid conversation with educators, students, parents, and experts who aren't afraid to speak their minds. Whether you are a concerned parent, a dedicated teacher, or someone with a curious mind, Join us as we navigate through the maze of education, separating fact from fiction and exposing the truths that often hide in plain sight. Buckle up because Schoolhouse Croc is about to take you on an eye-opening journey through the heart of Colorado's education system. It's time to question, challenge, and uncover the croc that might just change the way you see public education in the Centennial State. Again, I am your host, Stacey Castile, and thank you so much for joining us. Today, I have Amber Cecil as a guest. Amber, can you please introduce yourself for us? Yes, thank you so much for having me. My name is Amber Cecil. I am a Colorado native. I grew up in the Greeley area, and I still live up in this area. My husband and I operate a local family-owned business, which has served Northern Colorado for more than 25 years. And we do that with the help of his parents. We have one daughter who is currently in fifth grade in a local Christian school. I am heavily involved in my community and my daughter's school and my church. I serve as the board secretary for the Wealth Faith Partnership Council, the treasurer for the Greater Republican Women. I'm the co-coordinator for the children's ministry at my church, the co-coordinator of Daughters of Destiny with Miss Stacy, classroom assistant, and a recent school board campaign manager, just to name a few of my things. I learned many, many years ago that God was actually directing me to be involved with kids at many different levels. I've actually been involved in serving children's ministry for almost 20 years, and now I'm helping to teach in the classroom, and I've been placed with them to advocate for them on every different level, to pray for them any way possible. So even when I tried to step away from it, God really has directed me back toward children. After some situations that we had with our daughter being in a district charter school, we encountered some things that where she would come home and she would tell us kind of some strange little things. Like she told us one day that, hey, mom, did you know that a boy can be a girl? And she told my mom something similar where she told her in the vehicle that she wanted to be a boy. And so these things started kind of shooting off a light bulb in our heads. We started praying about it and we really knew that we wanted to move her out of the school and we prayed about it and we ended up moving her into the Christian school. And we really thought that she was in a, in a great charter school. It was a school that everyone boasts about. They said, this great school. In fact, you have to put your child on on a list for a lottery, basically from birth, which is what we did. So we were really excited when she got into this school and we decided, forget it. She, she's, we've got to go. And so we went and ended up pulling her out. But this still kind of left something inside of me that I really needed to start digging. And so at that moment, I, I knew that I needed to do a deep dive into school curriculum. And I started kind of diving into their, their stuff, but I really, it kind of took me down lots and lots of paths. And it really led me through the Colorado Department of Education, of course, into some national programs and some, some bills and some acts that had been passed as well. And so it just led me to keep diving and keep learning. And the things that I have found have just blown my mind. So I'm going to continue to advocate for the kids in Colorado, the kids in our districts, kids locally at every level that I can. 
even though my kid is no longer in the district school, I have to fight for these kids. I definitely agree. Thank you so much, Amber, for introducing yourself. So a uh, little background on me for anybody who may not know me. My name is Stacy Castile. I am an Air Force wife. My husband is currently active duty. We have three children together, two 17-year-olds and a 7-year-old. Our older two children are in public school, whereas our youngest does attend a private Christian academy. And part of the reason that he does, you know, is not just because of what's going on with public education and some of the concerns that we have there, even though that is a, a major contributing factor. Another reason is, though, is that my husband and I, we have determined that it is very important to us for our son to have a biblical education and understanding of what's going on. And so it just made sense to us for him to be in a Christian school so that he could get that biblical education. I personally have endured a lot of education. I have an associate's in business administration and accounting, a bachelor's with an emphasis in business and accounting, and then a master's in business with an emphasis in accounting. So I definitely have gone through the entire educational system, public educational system, from kindergarten all the way into grad school. In addition to the education, I have spent a lot of time volunteering in our community. I am on the World Faith Partnership Council. I am the vice chair of the Human Services Advisory Committee for Weld County. In addition to that, I volunteer at my daughter's high school on the School Accountability Committee. I also just try to attend as many school board meetings as possible and, and have an understanding of what is going on. I am a former school board candidate. I did run for school board in the Greeley Evans District in November of 2023. And even though I was not elected, I have chosen not to just give up and walk away because to me the the public education system is is something that everybody needs to take seriously. I would say that on my campaign trail I encountered a majority of people who would say, "Well, my kids are grown or my kids are homeschooled or I don't have kids in the district. I don't have kids at all." The major thing that they're not realizing is the fact that they are taxpayers. They are taxpayers in Greeley and Evans. They are taxpayers in the state of Colorado, and they are federal taxpayers. And because of that, they should care what's going on. They need to pay attention because our money is going to help to prepare these children so that they can be our future, our tomorrow. And if we are not being good stewards of what is going on, in the education system, we need to reevaluate what we're doing because something isn't right. Something isn't going the way it's supposed to go. We have so many topics that we would like to talk about on this podcast just to try to help educate these people. Like that's this is our target audience is, is the taxpayers, the people who contribute because at some point, they're going to encounter children who have gone through the public school system, whether it's at the grocery store, at the mall, at the restaurants, you know, somewhere at some point, they're going to encounter them. And we need to make sure that they are the they are given the best education to help provide for the best future for each child. It may not look the same in terms of what they want their futures to be or what their futures are. But we still need to be making sure that we are truly taking advantage of this opportunity to provide education for them and make sure that they are learning stuff to help prepare them for tomorrow. I think, Amber, you can probably go on for days about stories that you've heard from your good friend that drives a bus in the city here and the encounters they have with the students of the Greeley Evans District 6, right? Oh, she's told me numerous stories 
I mean, she has such an incredible sense of humor. So she always, you know, tells me in a, in a way where it's to make me laugh and that sort of thing. But there's times where you can see the frustration behind it because she's, you know, in a situation where she has to pick these students up and she's in a, in a, a situation where she could in some aspects possibly lose her job if she intervenes in, in, in some aspects as well. Yeah, absolutely. As we continue to hear stories about just some of the, the craziness that is going on in public education right now, it seems as if the number one answer is pull your kids out of the school district. Would you agree, Amber? Absolutely. I think we hear that being shouted from the rooftops of every conservative voice. Um, I mean, you hear it from Candace Owens to, I mean, there's even pastors telling us to do the same thing. And uh, I mean, that's, it seems like the logical thing to do, doesn't it? Yes, of course it does. And and I'm not disagreeing with that at all. Like I, I would not disagree that it is important that we take our children out of the public education system because of just a desire to protect them, right? Like to, to give them a quality education, to prevent them from being exposed to inappropriate age content for them. Absolutely. I mean, it's what I did. Yes. I mean, let's be honest. It's exactly what I did. Yes. And so I would agree with that, but I don't know if that is necessarily the best or the only response. I think it might be a a two-pronged approach or something because yes, protect your kids at all costs, protect your kids. But also what about your tax dollars? And what about those kids whose parents are the ones that that the government, that, you know, just that whole entity tries to take advantage of? You know, the single moms who have multiple children who have to work multiple jobs to make ends meet that can't be around at night to help with homework or during the day or some of those things. We have to stand up for them, for those who cannot stand up for their children or or are not aware of what's going on or or don't want to believe it. I know I don't want to believe it. I Absolutely. don't want to I would say I would agree with you. That's probably the number one thing when we were campaigning that people said it's not happening here. Yes. That's not happening here. We don't see that. That's not going on. Yeah. And and our response would be, but it is. But it is let me show you. Let me show you what's going on. Let me, let me prove it to you. And so, yes, I would say if it is what you can do, pull your kids out. You have to do what's best for your family. If, if pulling your children out is the best thing for your children, if it's, the, if it's the best thing for your family, then that's what you should do. And you should certainly pray about it. I mean, I wouldn't do anything you know, make a rash decision. I, I would definitely pray about it. Make sure it really is the best thing to do for you guys. But there are going to be situations where families can't do that. And I know everyone's, there's been so many voices out there that say, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. There are going to be situations where I don't think families can. Agreed. Would you agree with that? I agree. And, you know, I'm, I feel like a lot of times people are, you know, when we start talking about some of the stuff, they immediately jump to, you're a book banner, you're a book banner. But that's that's actually not what our sole focus is. Are we concerned about the content of the material in the libraries? 100%. I'm sorry, but as a grown woman, I don't want to read a story and cannot understand a story about a father who is sexually assaulting his young daughter and from his point of view i can't i can't grasp that any literary value in that is lost on me i don't know how to navigate that myself how do i navigate through that with my child but that's not the only thing i mean we have concerns with the curriculum activism over education the concept of no child left behind all of the the new cool terms that are being used social emotional learning critical race theory equity and no we're not learning about 
buying a home and how you build up equity. Like kids aren't learning valuable lessons like no. that. <laughs> no, they're not. They're, they're learning. They're they're learning how how inequality of systems how how our our country is founded and every system within it is unjust that's what they're learning yes yep and you know how how to do different sexual acts as opposed to you know how to learn about equity in a home <laughs> not to keep and, going back to that but and, you know some of those <laughs> things that they do truly need to know they're not learning and instead they're learning some pretty extreme and concerning information as opposed exactly exactly and so you know it's it's what happens to the children who are left in these schools by pulling out it does create it can create it should create i guess i should say it does it can it should create some competition it should create competition where these schools have to compete and and perform better to compete with the schools that are performing well like private schools like charter schools when when people pull their kids out and put them into charter schools you really do have to watch the charter schools too because oh. there are some incredible charter schools out there absolutely 100 percent amazing charter schools out there but not all charter schools are created equal. Correct. And I was just going to say, too, a lot of the charter schools are under the umbrella of the public school system in that area. And so they have to, I, I mean, for lack of a better, a better phrase, they almost have to kneel to the public school system because that's, that's kind of like their, you know, next level authority. Yes, and, and really look at the administration within the charter schools and see where they're pulling administration from. Is it, are they pulling in administration from within the districts or from people who have been in district positions? Because those people are bringing district ideals. Yes, 100%. Not that everyone who comes from the district is, does have I just district ideals, but if you see, like, for example, the school that we were in, they used to have pretty conservative value system even the way that the school was set up and kind of just kind of their approach to learning was a very conservative approach and there was a drastic shift with between between our daughter's kindergarten and her first grade year and we saw it we felt it and it wasn't until she started coming home and saying these bizarre things that we were like well Hold and hold up. Wait a minute. Back the truck up. What's going on? What am I missing? And then we started seeing teachers leave, good teachers, and we're going, okay, why are they leaving? Why is there this mass exodus? What's happening in the school that's making such great people leave? And there are still some really great teachers there who are holding on for dear life, but it makes you wonder: Are they drowning? What's going on? Why are they? You know. What's going to happen to them if they keep holding their value system? Are they eventually going to give in? You know, those types of things. So you see this shift happen. Well, what changed? Administration changed. Yes. And then I think, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions is, is that we are in Weld County. This is the, you know, Republican Mecca of Colorado. You know, we shake our fists to the governor all the time, right? Like, they think that we're good, but there's a school district outside of the Greeley Evans School District, a uh, small conservative, and they recently hired a superintendent that was in administration in the Pooter School District. Well, we know that the Pooter School District values do not align with Weld County values, right? Exactly. Then they also hired a principal from Chicago, Chicago. I mean, like you can't get much different from Weld County than Chicago public Complete schools. Complete opposite of Weld County is Chicago. <laughs> so then when they slowly start to have some issues, is it any wonder? Is it any wonder? And, you know, one of the other things that I think that has been 
a very easy solution for multiple families is you pull them out of the school district because the state of Colorado has school of choice and you drive them somewhere else. There's a family that lives here in Greeley and they drive their kids 35 minutes one way to school. I'm sure there's multiple families, right? And that's great. Like there are, you know, the smaller school districts are definitely a safer place. They are more likely to be willing to stand up to the state and say, wait a minute, your comprehensive sex ed curriculum does not coincide with our values as a school district. And so they, you know, can stand their ground and they're more willing to. But the problem then comes as to what has that child been exposed to while they were in public school in, you know, a bigger city? And what are they taking with them to those small towns? And and, and are they potentially, for lack of a better word, you know, passing on corrupting those other children from what they learned in a bigger city's public school system? Yeah, I mean, that is that is definitely a concern that that we should have. Another concern, too, is that in some of these programs, it's built in to, t- to not tell their parents about it. Yeah. So they're not supposed to actually open up and have conversations with their parents. So there's these questions that arise because they're being given this information that is well past their mindset okay so they're giving they're being given information that their brains just cannot comprehend i mean really cannot comprehend it's <laughs> it's not meant to yet and so they're going to have questions they're going to have things that are going okay this is this is weird i don't want to this is you know i don't i can't process this because it's too much for me and really it is who are they going to go to they're going to either go to their peers or they're going to go to an adult within the school yeah, that's that's going to open up some really questionable doors as well. Completely. The districts are taking away the parents roles and rights. They are making it so that, you know, right during COVID, everybody trying to get more involved with their children doing homework. Right. How many parents said I didn't know what was going on until I started helping them with their homework And they don't want to help with homework because then we'll learn the material that they are or are not learning. They don't want us to have to worry about taking them to the doctors. They can push through medical access through the school districts. They don't want, you know, you to be a safe person. Right. They're telling kids, you know, well, if your parents don't agree with this line of thinking or if they say this to you, then they're not a safe person for you. They're not a safe person. They're not a safe person. They're not someone you can trust. And I mean, I think that even though as parents, we have to keep fighting to be in our children's lives. This is why we need to stand up for public education as a whole, because every parent should be able to be and have an active role in their child's life, right? Every parent should be able to be involved. And I would say, you know, every, when we're talking about tax dollars, whether you pull your child out or not, your tax dollars are still going to go into the public school school system. And it goes at every level because whether you have a child enrolled or not, you're paying taxes into the school system, both locally and federally. Yeah. So both local and federal tax dollars are given to the school districts. And you want to make sure that you're getting a good value for your money. And right now, your return on value sucks. Yes. There's no other word for it. It sucks. It sucks. Yep. Our kids cannot read, write, or do math at grade level. Correct. Period. 
And, you know, you see the kids that may, you know, typical teenage job, right, fast food. They're relying on those registers to tell them not only the change that is needed, but how to break that change down. They need that. They cannot just say, okay, you're owed $4.18 and and find that exact correct change without the computer saying $4 bills, right? One dime, one nickel, three penny. They're not doing that. Like they, they need that because their brain is not doing that on its own. And they can't count it back to you. If I give you $5, and I'm owed $4.18, they can't give me 18 cents and say, <laughs> yep. 18 cents makes $1, One. Two, two, three, three four, four five. and five. That's they confusing. That. That's confusing to them. I mean, and, and that's, and that's a sad, that's a very sad thing, you know, and I, and as someone who's been in, in who had been in banking, I mean, I, I obviously have, I haven't been in banking in a, in a few years, but most of my adult life was in incapacity of some kind of a banking job. That makes me very sad that people can't do that kind of math because it's just counting. It's just counting. And you know, with our district, with District 6, District 6 has a few incredible programs. I mean, truly incredible programs to help these kids out, especially these kids that are not going to go into a a college or into a further education of some kind where they're going to go into the workforce. They need, they need some kind of credential to be able to go on to um, have a licensure or something like that to be able to get a job. And there's some incredible programs. There's some incredible um, business partners in the area who are willing to work with the district and give these kids a chance. What are the odds of, of these kids working out like one in five one in five kids yeah and one in five kids works out it's and like you said they have all these amazing opportunities for kids to dip their toe into the workforce more in Greeley Evans the superintendent Dr. Pilch had gotten the idea from the university lab school here in town to have areas of careers focus. So it's career technical education, and it helps the children learn more about their areas. So in District 6, when you enter into high school, you pick a what's called a pathway. And it's, it's kind of like when you go into college and you pick a major. So it could be business, it could be criminal justice, it could be performing arts, it could be there was medical, so many there was medical education interior like design yep. yeah a bunch. they really get down into it and i think that's a great opportunity because as a as a student who racked up unnecessary school debt or student loan debt because i wasn't quite sure what i wanted to be this is great so then kids can get a an example of like oh hey this is cool but also I am not very interested in, you know, I I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but then I saw blood squirting and I was like, "Uh, never mind, I can't be a doctor. That's, you know, not a fit for me. Like those situations, that's perfect for our kids. And I think that's a great option. And if you're homeschooling your kids or if they're in private school, that, that may be an opportunity that they miss out on. So pulling them out may not be the solution because you may not be able to give them a, a variety like that. Granted, with homeschooling, you can definitely do a lot more than maybe some of the private schools in terms of that because you have more. But I think that, you know, it just keeps coming back at the end of the day to, like you said, uh, the return on investment is not there. When employers are, if you own a business, you're in town, you pay into the the mill levy override for the school district, the bonds, property taxes, all that stuff. You're paying to the school district and say, you know, once these kids graduate, you're going to hire them. How much money and resources are you going to have to put in and use to be able to get them trained? Because if some of their basic education is missing important foundation blocks to it, you're going to have to help them get those before that they can be a 
positive employee for you where they're not costing you more money than what they're helping you make. I mean, I know people don't feel like capitalism is good, but at the end of the day, right, that's that's <laughs> exactly. really the important part of capitalism. Exactly. And and I think we owe it to our kids to give them the absolute best that we can possibly give them. So why aren't we? Why aren't we doing that? Agreed. I guess that's the question that I have. Why aren't we doing the best we can for them? Why is why is it just good enough is good enough? Yep. And I, I mean, we see that so, so often, you know, like you'd said, that children are not able to read, write, and do math at grade level, but our graduation rates are great, so that's all that should matter. Don't worry about these little rates. Don't worry about test scores. Don't worry about the fact that you asked your or told your 16 year old daughter that you will be leaving at a quarter till nine. And she says, what time is that? And you're saying, what do you mean? Are you kidding? Me? Like, you know, <laughs> it, we need to be able to do that. So never mind that stuff. Our graduation rates are perfect. They're great. They've increased so much. Congratulations to us. We've gone from a society of aiming, right? I mean, on paper, it sounds great. No child left behind. But we know that's not the truth. That's that's not even close to the truth. And in fact, I think we probably have more children that are left behind in some capacity than what we did before any of that started. I would agree. I think there's, you know, when we have a no child left behind and, and we don't have that anymore, we have ESSA, which yes. is the Every Student Succeeds Act, which replaced the no child left behind in the Obama administration, which is very similar. But what happens is you you're pushing kids forward you're not actually helping them catch up you're not helping them understand material and so they go on to the next grade into the next grade into the next grade not understanding the material and then they're just lost and so oftentimes they give up they drop out they just don't they don't learn the material it, it's it's heartbreaking because i kids are more capable of things then we're giving them credit for. Yes. Sometimes they just need a little bit more and that's okay. We all learn differently. That's okay. Yes. I would say that, you know, something that we are not capitalizing off as much as we should is through, you know, how many years have they been testing students to see where they're at? I mean, gosh, I remember that as a kid myself. And so I think that the thing that they talk about is, you know, oh, well, no children learn the same way. Or like you start a new job or, you know, you start a new class and they're like, how do you learn best? Hands on, listening, you know, those types of things. But we're not actually taking that information and utilizing it the way that we should be. We're just saying, oh, not everybody learns the same. So let's change the content. Let's change how hard it is. Let's change that and not address the real issue that some kids take longer. Some kids, you know, are faster. Some, you know, we don't need to hold back Johnny because he's excelling, but Sally is struggling behind. Like, why are we not just letting them go at their own pace as opposed to changing the material so that Sally can get it, but now Johnny's confused because the new material doesn't make sense for him. Well, and they've taken away, you know, merit. And, and one of the things that has been really removed from a lot of schools is advanced placement. And and those types of programs because they're saying they're inequitable. Well, there's some kids that just need it. I know I took advanced placement. I needed it. I needed more of a challenge. I needed to be challenged in certain areas. Not every area because I didn't excel in every subject, but I needed it in some areas. Yep. Right? There were just some things that I just needed more of a challenge in. And then there were some things I totally bombed in. I was like, nope, bleh, suck. But there were just some things you needed a little bit more. And so while some kids excel in, in maybe all areas academically, maybe they don't excel in other things. So you find what the kids are good at, you help them and you use those. So it's just, it, it, it just seems like instead we're just taking the lazy route. 
that's to me what it seems like. It's the lazy route. We're taking the lazy route. Okay, well, let's just lazily decide how we're going to approach every child. Well, that yep. doesn't work. We can't do that. So when we're talking about taxes, I want to talk about this for a second because I remember you telling me, Stacy, and I don't live in the city of Greeley anymore. So how much did you say on your tax bill went to the mill levy? How, how much? Of yes. Property tax. So we got our property tax evaluation and the breakdown back in, I believe, March of 2023. Over 60% of my taxes went to the school district. Yeah. So you're going to be getting another one here in like two months, roughly two months, a month and a half, two months. So somewhere around March again, because they're due in April, right? Yes. Probably tax office due in April. So even if it's escrowed in or whatever, you'll still get notification of what it is. So I urge people, look at that. See what your breakdown is. Even if you're not in the city of Greeley, you most likely have a mill levy attached to your property in whatever district you're in, because I don't know of many districts that don't have an override, a mill yeah. levy override. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't think there's one in, in our area that doesn't have one right now. And just really quick for anybody who may not be aware, a mill levy override is something that school districts, the residents inside of school district boundaries would vote on. And per the state, you're only allowed to take out so much from somebody's property taxes and, and put it towards public education. But the mill levy override would basically be the the citizens of that school district saying we believe that the these children deserve more money and so we are willing to waive or override the limit that the state puts in place and the school district can collect more than that and just in case you think, oh my gosh, this sounds like a terrible idea, you're not completely wrong because we need to see how it's being spent. We need to make sure that they're not taking additional funds that they're trying to hold on to because they're worried about future growth. And mill levy override funds cannot be used for physical things like buildings. That's where the bonds come in. That's the bonds. Yep. Yes. And those are completely separate and also probably something you also have. <laughs> yes, 100%. So one of the things that happened in the Greeley Evans District 6 school district back in November of 2022 was the district pushed forward. They had a mill levy override in place and it was set to sunset at the end of 2023. So December 2023, it was going to sunset. Yep, it would have ended. It would have stopped at the end of this last year. Meaning, meaning they no longer, the money that was set aside for this no levy or the money that to increase it would have stopped. Yep. But the district was panicking because they didn't want it to run out. And so they put forward a campaign to renew it for another 10 years. 10 years is a very long time. Very, very, very long time. But they were able to mask it to the voters and the low information voters and say, oh, this would not increase your taxes. It would just extend the mill levy. Well, if you think about it, yes, it may not increase the percentage, but everybody in Weld, everybody in the state of Colorado, not just Weld County, everybody in the state of Colorado has been seeing how their property valuation is going up, which is causing their property taxes to skyrocket. Hello, Prop HH, right? But mm -hmm. what they're doing, they're, what they're banking on people not being educated enough to understand and know is, yes, you are not increasing the percentage, but... When the value of your property increases, the amount they're taking is increasing. Five percent of, you know, uh, of a hundred is five dollars, right? But five percent of a thousand is fifty dollars. Like, and then yeah, and then you have to also take into consideration your population growth. Yep. 
Yep. Which and is significant right now in Greeley. It, and I was just going to say, it, it, not even just Greeley, like the entire county. Well, well, um, county, but, but, especially, but Greeley specifically is, yep, is Especially in Greeley. And so if you're getting more money per property, that that's an increase. You know, just a quick little tidbit, and then we can kind of wrap up this portion of the the episode. But uh, they, the voters voted in November of 2022 to extend the mill levy override another 10 years. Every August before school starts, the school district here in town has a back-to-school bash where it gives parents the opportunity to get some help with some school supplies if their children need physicals. It's like a one-stop shop. It's a Saturday morning. It makes it easier for parents to do the things that they need to do to be able to get their children registered and ready for school. That would be starting, you know, I think it's usually like a week or two before school starts. So after we vote to extend that, they had record numbers of participants needing to come and get help with backpacks and school supplies. There's, I mean, do we not think that there's a correlation between extended, because I, I mean, we could probably have 18 episodes just talking about the out of touch with reality that the Greeley Evans School District board is for the most part. But, you know, they were, they were like, oh, renters don't matter. They're not going to feel it. Do they not understand that landlords pass along those increases? So when the landlord's property taxes go up, then that means that their rent is going to go up to cover it. So if our rent is skyrocketing, these are the parents that are coming to the back to school bash and, and the district's celebrating it. So they're celebrating you not being educated enough to understand how taxes work. They're benefiting off of the fact that you need them, and that's what they want. You're not smart enough, and they want you to be easily controlled. And and that's essentially what they're trying to do right now. And they were very excited. We served so many families. Well, it's great that we can serve families. I love communities that get to serve families. But it also was very concerning that we had to serve so many families. Yes. Yes, completely. Well, that kind of wraps up this portion of the episode. We just wanted to briefly touch on some of the things that you can expect in this podcast. Um, You know, we have so many different topics. It feels like every day there's a new headline in the news, a new concern going on. So we want to try and cover all of that stuff that is happening here in the state of Colorado. So as Coloradoans, we can stand up together and fight for all of our children. We are going to be talking mainly about the public education, but like Amber has said a couple of times, charter schools are not completely free of the craziness, and sometimes it can be even worse in the charter schools than in the public schools just because of how they are set up. We will be talking and having guests that have pulled their kids, are homeschooling their kids, different private schools or charter schools that they may be attending. We're going to hear from them and hear their experiences. Something else that we've definitely encountered quite a bit with uh, the school district here is the idea that if you're not a parent of a student in the district, your voice does not carry much value. But what they're failing to understand or to take into consideration is, is that that parent has a school age kid. That kid should be in the public school district, but something happened and it's caused them to pull the kids out. What was that? Why did that happen? How was that handled? What are some resources that they can give other parents who might be in the same situations? How can we support and wrap around any parents that are encountering some of the craziness going on inside public education right now and encourage them? Because school boards across the state are gaslighting parents completely <laughs> and, and not just parents just you know community members in general yep that's that's another one of the things that we've been hearing at the school board meetings is well you're not a parent why do you have something to say here well I'm a community member <laughs> yeah or I'm a business owner or I'm a concerned grandparent or I'm a concerned 
whatever. Taxpayer. I mean, taxpayer. Yeah. I, I, I have a voice in this community. I'm allowed to say something and, and they really attack. They go on the attack. And that is a very big concern. We're also going to be covering some of the legislation that comes down through the state of Colorado during this legislative session. Uh, we will be covering curriculum. A lot of times the curriculum changes to, you know, implement comprehensive sex ed or anti-bullying or critical race theory or social emotional learning or any of those programs comes down through legislation. So we will be covering that, the different types of curriculum, the concerns with critical race theory, social emotional learning. Uh, we will be talking about panorama surveys and surveys in general. We will be talking about sexuality and why we are currently in the spot that we are. I believe this generation percentage of LGBT children is like astronomically higher than any other generation before. So let's let's talk about that. What's going on? Just basically covering hot topics in Colorado right now, as well as shenanigans from districts, lowering requirements to graduate to boost up graduation numbers. Let's talk about children who have to take remedial classes after they've graduated and they go on to college if they are not quite at the college level yet sometimes they have to take remedial classes let's get into that let's talk about that because they're having to pay money out of their pockets to learn stuff that they should have learned in high school and let's find out the reasoning did they not learn it because it wasn't taught did they not learn it because they messed around you know let's let's have a better understanding as to you know, why kids are having to take remedial classes in college. And then also just issues within school boards. We have a lot of school boards in the state of Colorado that are extremely power hungry and are taking advantage of the role that they are in. Uh, so yeah. We hope that you guys tune in again. We will have a variety of different guests. Um, Amber Cecil will be a staple in our episodes. And we're just going to be pretty much sitting down, a couple of friends, and talking about how do we get to protect our children. Awesome. I'm excited for it. I am too. Thank you so much, Amber, for joining us today. And thank you guys so much for listening. Please be sure to follow Schoolhouse Croc on Twitter, also known as X. And be sure to stay tuned and stay plugged in because the kids of Colorado deserve it and deserve you. Have a great day.